Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in and welcome to another episode of In the Studio. I'm Lynn Weaver, and today our guest is Sasha Abramsky. He is the author of at least eight best-selling books, and uh, he's also a journalist and a uh, UC Davis lecturer in the writing program. Thank you very much for coming in, Sasha. Oh, it's a joy to be here. Uh, I am so looking forward to reviewing with you your latest book, Jumping at Shadows, The Triumph of Fear and The End of the American Dream, which has already uh, had uh, national acclaim. I'm, someone said that the book is a serious or pensive, rather, exploration of the American culture of fear. But it's much more than that. Uh, so much more that I wasn't able to catalog it. And it would be best, in a way, to discuss it chapter by chapter. But of course, we're not going to do that. So let's talk about the central theme of the book, which is this fear that affects every aspect of American culture and, in a way, society. It's almost like an epidemic. And uh, one of the aspects that seems to be affecting at the moment is our politics. And you talk a lot about this, or you write about this in your book. So how do you think this culture of fear plays into the hands of our current political narrative? Yeah, no, that's a great question. The, the book itself came out of a lot of reporting I'd been doing over many, many years about how people were making decisions that affected their daily lives. And some of those decisions were political, and some of them were economic, and some of them were about how they parented their children. Some were about things like medical care um, or travel. And one of the things that struck me was, for many, many people, fear was the sort of petri dish in which their daily lives were growing up, that the way in which they were understanding the world, it was almost like they had a distorted lens in front of their eyes. Yes. And they put on those lenses, and they saw the world as this very, very bleak, destructive place where it was very predatory, where people were out to attack them or their property or their families. And it struck me that if you live your life that way, if you're in this permanent state of alert, this permanent state of nervousness, of anxiety, that it affects you very fundamentally. It affects you physiologically. It changes the chemical structure of your body. You have um, chemicals like cortisol and adrenaline coursing yes. through. But when it changes the chemical structure of your body, it changes how you actually respond to events, that in an era of stress, we look for simple soundbite kind of solutions much more than we do nuance. Oh, that's that, very true. You know, yes. nuance seems to be sort yes. of almost irrelevant at a moment of heightened fear. We want action. Yes. Um, and it plays very well to the sort of demagogic strengths of a candidate like Donald Trump, who is willing to use that fear and stoke divisions and pit one religious or racial group or economic group or sexual group against another, yes. all for the sake of personal political gain. Yes. And I got fascinated by this, that what happens to our political culture, what happens to our democratic culture in an era in which fear is the currency of the realm? Well, the, and, and particularly in the United States, because of course this demagoguery we've seen over the years and centuries everywhere else, yeah. but uh, America being a democracy and uh, cherished freedom and common sense uh, is, uh, is very new in my way and very frightening. Um, now, would you say that uh, part of the reason why we have this culture of fear comes from the fact that we watch and read every day uh, a almost impossible dose of uh, uh, violence, so whether it's uh, fiction or real events. Would you say yeah. that is part of the reason? I think it's probably less to do with fiction in the traditional sense um, yes. and more to do with how we understand the news and the rise of what actually is fiction, this sort of whole industry of fake news, this whole industry of um, trolling and everything else. Um, but look, when I was growing up in the 1970s in England, 
We had three television channels. If you wanted to get the news, there were certain times a day. You go for the one o'clock radio news, you go for the five o'clock evening news, or the nine or ten o'clock TV news. Yes. And the rest of the time, whatever was happening in the world, and there were bad things happening in the 1970s, but you got on with your lives. And as technology shifts, the news becomes more omnipresent. And so one thing that happens is the amount of news, as we get cable TV, as we get satellite radio, as we get the um, rise of computer technology, as we get smartphones and um, tablets and everything else, we sort of end up in this omnipresent news environment where you can just sort of click, 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 and you get one bad story after another. The second thing that happens is the type of news and the way we approach the news changes. So, you know, if you sort of think of the BBC and the sort of keep calm and carry on mentality, yes. <laughs> and you then contrast it with the hyperbolic sort of yeah. breath, you know, shouting, shouting you know, screaming, Fox breathing, news Fox News or CNN Rush Limbaugh. And, and um, others. Well, it can be, I mean, it can be anything. It's, yes. it's not necessarily ideological. It's just the way we approach news increasingly is as entertainment. Yes. And this started before satellite TV. It started before... Um, the internet, it begins with local news about 30, 40 years ago yes. when the business model changes and yes. you end up with this idea if it bleeds, it leads. So lots and lots of crime stories, lots and lots of stories about car crashes, things that make us scared and that are going to attract our attention. Mm -hmm. And all of that's magnified in the current moment. And you know, one of the things that's really fascinating about social media in particular is it compresses space and time. So you know, 40 years ago, if a bad thing happened 10,000 miles away, we'd pay it some attention, but it wouldn't saturate our consciousness. Today, if a bomb goes off in Iraq or in Syria or yes. there's an epidemic in West Africa or whatever it might be, that sense of distance is removed. Yes. And the internet, the way it functions, it lets us feel that everything is in our own backyard. And partly that's good. It means that we have the ability to go further and further afield yes. and roam further and further afield culturally in how we get the news. But the downside of that is it means we feel we're permanently under threat. Because yes. there's always going to be a bad story somewhere on Earth. There's always going to be a disease outbreak right. somewhere or a bomb attack right. somewhere or a resurgent fundamentalist terrorist group somewhere. Yes. And when we lose that sense of perspective, we feel permanently besieged. Um, and it plays perfectly to our political moment. It's fascinating to watch the interplay of politics and fear and technology yes. in 2017. And, and I would go even beyond that because we are so encapsulated in this world of news, whether it's uh, real or, or accurate or whatever, or propaganda, uh, we lose sight of our reality, perhaps? I'm not sure it's that we lose sight of our reality. It's that we view our reality in a very different way from the way we used to That's view true. our reality. That's so true. an example would be, you know, if you were around in the 1960s or 70s, most families let their kids go to school by themselves yes. or maybe walk down the yes. street to visit a friend unaccompanied or go to the playground with a friend. That was just normal. And then in the 80s and 90s, and 2000s in particular, we got really scared and we started making these assumptions. If we let our kids do these basic things like go around the corner by themselves, really bad things will happen. Now, it wasn't because the crime rate had gone up. The crime no. rate actually fell between fell. the 1970s and today. The crime rate's gone down dramatically. But our perception of risk shifted yes. because we became so saturated with these stories about things happening. Yes. So it's how we understand our reality, how we interpret data, how we calibrate risk. Yeah. That's what shifted. And to me, it's fascinating. And the interviews it I was is. doing as I was going around the country, you know, this book is marketed as a political book, and it sort of really is in many ways. But it is a reportage, mostly. It's isn't reportage, it? yes. and it's about the psychological moment as much as the political moment. It's yes. about the psychology that occurs, the changes in our psychology in a risk based culture, or yes. a risk averse culture, where we assume really bad things are going to happen, and we invest a lot of energy financial energy, political energy, economic yes. energy in stopping those bad things happening yes. and in sort of battening ourselves down as a culture. Yes, and, and this is why I thought it was a very complex because you do interview uh, many experts, psychologists, um, uh, and uh, anthropologists, and, but also. Uh, uh, offer us uh, so many examples. Some of them are really uh, uh, examples from real life, which are really terrifying in some ways. And of course, we could talk about the guns, the, the obsession with guns, and the phobias, and, and the drug. I mean, there's a lot of things that per pervert, pervert in a way uh, and 
condu uh, yeah, uh, conducive I, I, I to? I think what's really interesting is both what we fear and what we don't fear. So, oh, tell me more well, about you that. Know, so you mentioned this guns, for example. Yes. Most Americans are more afraid of gun control than yes. guns, despite yes. the fact that we have one mass shooting after another after another. Uh, more Americans are scared of spiders than nuclear weapons. Yes. Well, you know, if a nuclear weapon went off, it would be an absolute civilizational catastrophe. Yes. Um, very few Americans, until very recently, gave much credence to the notion of climate change. And the same thing, climate change is this slow-moving catastrophe that is going to displace populations, it's going to impact the yes. economy, impact the environment, impact agriculture. It's something we should be very nervous about and should invest a lot of energies into yes. trying to prevent the worst consequences of. But we don't. And that really interests me. You know, why is it we're scared about certain things and not others? Well, so, and, this you know, is, and, and this is why your book is extremely... Uh, fascinating uh, in uh, at, at many levels, as I said. But I we have a limited amount of time, and I want to squeeze in some more questions for you. Um, in your view, um, how can we? And this is a difficult question. Take out of the equation this terrible equation of fear uh, an element that would help the American culture to uh, come back to a certain common yeah. sense sanity? Yeah, that's a great question. I think part of it is just about introspection and about thinking before we act. Very good, um, yes. Because really, a lot of times, we see something on the news, we go into a sort of panic mode, we look for a quick solution that doesn't necessarily make much sense, and then we have to live with the consequences. Yes. So a case in point would be, you know, we're very fearful of terrorism at the moment. Oh, and, you know, with, with so. reason, because there are groups like ISIS out there and Al-Qaeda out there which want to do harm. But we might have become so scared of terrorism that we start sacrificing civil liberties. And it doesn't actually keep us safer, but it does yeah. make us less free as a people. Yes. Um, and then we go for political solutions that sound sort of simple and effective, but actually are very counterproductive. So an example would be Trump saying, well, I'm going to torture terrorism suspects. Well, if you torture terrorism suspects, where's the prohibition on someone torturing Americans of in course. reciprocity. Of or course. if you ban Muslims from entering yes. the country, you know, where's the incentive for other countries to not say, you know what, we don't feel like having Americans come to our country. And once you go down that road, you start building walls, you start imposing bans, nobody wins. It's a lose-lose situation. Um, and so, you know, one, one thing that I've been urging people to think about is, do the solutions that we're glomming on to actually make sense? Yes. Um, but the second thing is, you talked a lot earlier about the news and how yes. much we sort of, you know, we get our cell phones out, we click, 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 bad news, bad news, bad news. It's important to be informed, but it's also important to understand when to slow down. Yes. And sometimes it's good to take a breather. Absolutely. Not, 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 not in anything other than the fact it's a sort of mental health check. Yes. And you end up just as well informed if you look at the news at the end of the day than if you're looking at the news, you know, 20 times an hour. Yes. And I'm not immune from this. I have to say, you know, there are days when I'm just obsessively checking my cell phone because it's so easy and it's so seductive. Well, it is. And, then I have and you to mentioned slow down. that in your first yeah. chapter, and, which yeah, is a very interesting. You know, one, yes. one of the things that I'm trying to look at in this book is what are the collective impacts on community of the ways that we're behaving? Yes. And one of the things we're doing with technology is we're atomizing. Yes. That we're not talking to other people. We're not going outside of our comfort zones. Yes. We're not looking to sort of cross barriers, but we're battening down the hatches. We're looking for the echo chamber online. Yes. And echo chambers are never healthy. No. In the end, they just deafen you. The noise no. gets louder and louder and louder. You just end up with this noise in your head. And I think it's really important that we work out ways to use technology effectively, but not to let technology use us, that we want to be in control of that. And, and you I are think absolutely that's a really good right. way of unplugging and you know, getting a less fear-based, yes. more rational-based yes. culture. Yes, and uh, uh, t time is running very, very short, and there's a couple of other. We should have a sequel to this interview. <laughs> but there is one, uh, quickly, if you may. Um, what would you like to say to the future readers of Jumping at Shadows, uh, The Triumph of Fear, and The uh, End of the American Dream. What would you like to say? Well, I wrote, Maybe I, just a couple okay. of words. So I wrote the book in 2016. I was feeling very bleak as Trump's election. 26 days? Uh, no, 2016. As Trump's oh, election, 2016. Sorry. As Trump's sorry, election sorry. campaign yes, took off yes. and got closer. And in the, the subtitle came about in the aftermath of the election. I think what I'd say a year on, if I'm talking to readers in the future about this, is the subtitle's too short. 
It shouldn't be the triumph of fear and the end of the American dream. It should be this really long, unwieldy subtitle that doesn't fit in a book page, which is the temporary triumph of fear and the temporary end of the American dream until a vast number of Americans across ideological divides realize this isn't a good way to live, realize that supporting demagogic candidates like Roy Moore in Alabama, who was recently handed a thumping defeat, that supporting candidates like Roy Moore or Donald Trump isn't the way forward, and until they came to their senses and re-established optimism at the core of the American dream. That's a terrible subtitle, but it's how I feel. I that we're love actually it. going to move it's away from wonderful. fear at some point. And, and it is a hopeful uh, way to, uh, to, I don't like to say end, but to wrap up, wrap up this interview. Thank you so much. Sasha, Sasha Abramsky for uh, taking a little time out of your very, very busy schedule and to come and talk to us. Uh, I really appreciate it very much. Pleasure. And, Thanks uh, so much. I've read it with a lot of joy and I will probably reread it until it really sinks in. So, and thank you all for watching from all of us here at Davis Media. Thank you and see you next time.